Our lesson today is uh, the gift of hope, and it comes to us out of John chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. I guess you probably can't see that writing too well up there this morning. I apologize to you. Gift of hope. I don't know if there's ever been a time in our lives when we needed hope any more than today. It just seems like that everything you see is negative and everything you see is ugly and God help us. When Julius Caesar confronted a man, or at least legend says he did, I don't know that it's really historical, he confronted a man, a slave that had been beaten and he was bloody and dirty and almost dead. And he said, man, were you ever alive? Were you ever alive? And there are people today who go through depression like you wouldn't believe. People today who don't see any need in living. I got a, a thing on Facebook from a great aunt, a great aunt, a great niece of mine. And she said, the day is so blue and I just don't feel like taking another breath. People don't see the need for living. I'm going to read the text from the book of John, chapter 5. Beginning with verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there at the Jerusalem, by the sheep market, or the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in the end was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was a Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him, That was cured. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful to thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is it that said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? I'll read verse 13 along with it. And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. There are a lot of things that we don't understand in the scriptures. I had a passage at Springville this morning that I could find several commentators that disagreed with me, Gerald. I know you can't believe that. <laughs> but they did. And th some things about this we don't understand. We don't understand God and eternity, do we? I mean, I can't explain to you what eternity is any more than I can show you God. We don't understand the gravity of sin in God's eyes. In our eyes, it's bad, but I'm convinced we don't even know. And we don't understand this stirring of the pool here. And that's why this little section's in there. And as Rex and I talked about this at Hardy's this week, we said, you know, at first people believe that's what happened. And then we said, wait a minute. They came back at every year at this, this season, whatever season this was. Probably this was Pentecost and then the first couple of weeks of June. I've got that in here. But probably they came back every year. And somebody got well. Or they wouldn't keep coming back. I don't understand that. 
but there's something else. It says that an angel came down and stirred those waters. And I don't understand that either. But the Bible says it, and I am called upon in faith to believe it. Do you know what? I say it happened. It was not a figment of their imagination. It was not something that just went on that they had tradition of. It actually happened. And the lame man was there. He was laying beside this pool. And he was hopeless. And by that I mean he knew he couldn't move very quickly. He didn't have anybody to get him in the water first. And he didn't have any hope of being the first one in to be healed. Well, today there are people who are in that same situation, except it's not exactly the same. People will pop pills in order to speed up. All you got to do is go to some store and right by the cash register, there'll be yellow jackets and there'll be caffeine tablets and there'll be five hour energy drinks and there'll be these wild drinks in the, in the uh, Coke section uh, that, uh, that'll pep you up. And then they go home and they get ready to go to bed and they take sleeping pills because they can't sleep at night. Never satisfied with nature. Now, I want you to know that last night I was one of those people. <laughs> my arthritis liked to kill me last night, and it would, every beat of my heart, my foot was just giving it this number. And I was putting asper cream on it, and I was taking uh, Tylenol, and I was taking B12. I was doing anything I thought possible to allow me to sleep. People do that, though, on a common and ordinary basis. And they feel like that life is simply not worth living. On Facebook this last week, a great niece of mine put up there that life wasn't worth living. You don't know how much that broke my heart and how I've been praying for her. Not a thing in the world I can do to help her. She's over a thousand miles away from me, but I can pray. And I say, Lord, help her. But if life feels so hopeless to people, in John chapter 1, verse 14, John said, we have seen his glory. John's intent is to show us the signs and the miracles that show the glory of God and that we should pull positive things out and give our lives meaning and something to live for. They reveal the glory of God. John's book omits a lot of the story of Jesus. He only puts in those things that he thinks is necessary for you to believe. He says in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, but these are written that you might believe. And in believing, you might have life. Show us the glory, John. So in the second chapter, he shows us the first miracle of Jesus, the changing of the water to the wine, and shows that God is interested in our lives. In chapter 4, he shows us the second sign, where a nobleman's son is healed 20 miles away, showing he is God over not only the physical things and interested in our lives, but he is God over wellness he can heal and it doesn't matter whether the boy who was healed had faith or not and it doesn't matter whether he's close to him or not god has control and in chapter five where our lesson is today we want to remember the purpose john is going to show you the glory of god in this event The events we pass over viewing and we simply leave God out. Don't miss him. <coughs> Don't miss him. We say the man was healed. Yes, he was. Jesus healed the man. Yes, he did. But don't miss that it was our God who did that. 
John says in some versions, sometime <clears throat> later. The King James says after this. You know, just a very short statement and to our minds. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But he doesn't really tell us when, except he was at a feast in Jerusalem. Now, in John chapter 2, Jesus had been in Jerusalem at the Passover feast. And in all probability, this was the next feast, which would be Pentecost. It occurs seven weeks later. Pentecost means 50 days. 50 days after the Passover. That would be seven weeks. So evidently, that's when this what we don't know. But if John's got the time order in order, then that's what it means. It was near the sheep market in the King James, or sheep gate in other translations. It was a pool called Bethesda. Now, the little church up here on the hill is called Bethesda Methodist Church. And it, it has to do with um, a new life, newness. Well, historians have dug up this pool in Jerusalem, and the background that you see here, and barely can see with these slides, that background is the ruins of that pool. We know where this happened. It's a very deep pool. The shallowest point is 165 feet deep. And the deepest point is 200 feet. It's deep. It's at the northeast corner of the temple, right close to it. It's trapezoid in shape. And what that means is there are four lines in there that are parallel making this shape. And one of them is shorter, so the two sides tilt in. We know what it's shaped like. And in each one of the corners, there's a stairway that goes down into it. At one of those stairways where this man was lying, waiting to get into the pool, is where this transpired. Now, there's one of four possible places that it could be. And we know where it happened. That, spring, that pool is fed by a spring underneath. And some people, if you read their commentaries, they'll say, eh, the angel really didn't stir that pool. That's just the bubbling up of that spring under there. I don't think that's it. The Holy Spirit said an angel came down and did it. Call upon your faith. Believe the angel and not the men. An angel stirred this pool, and the first to enter the water, God would heal. I believe it actually happened. But here is a pitiful and hopeless situation. This man has been an invalid for 38 years. Now, the catch is we don't know how old he is. He may have been 38 years old and born with this. Or it may be that some disease hit him or some uh, accident happened and caused him not to be able to get down into the pool. But what else is interesting here is that the Bible says he didn't have anybody to help him. Now those that helped him to the temple, he didn't even know. There was nobody to help him. Hopeless. <clears throat> And Jesus sees him and sees his need. He is moved with compassion and mercy. When it says he saw him lying at the, at the pool, it doesn't mean he physically observed him. What this means is that Jesus sees into him and sees his need. Jesus knows he doesn't have anybody to help him because Jesus knows the hearts of all men. Jesus could see him wherever he was in the world. You remember when he talked to Philip, he said, I saw you under the fig tree. Huh? You weren't anywhere near the fig tree. 
How did you see me? And because Jesus said that, he believed in who he was. God sees us physically wherever we are. But what this says, that Jesus sees his need. And because he's God, <coughs> excuse me, because God sees the need, he has compassion and mercy. <coughs> And he asked, and I put that in my words, do you want to get well? Hmm. Will you be made whole, is what the King James says. Do you want to get well? Because I'm convinced that there are a lot of people that do not want to get well. Now look at it like this. If I am incapacitated in some way, well, I have a slip disc in my back right now. And... <laughs> Since I have a slip disc, my wife has been doing a lot of things for me that she doesn't normally do, Dickie. And you know, it's really good. <laughs> I might like that attention and not want her to know how wet quickly I get well. So she'll keep those things up. There are a lot of people who enjoy being sick. They like to complain about it. They like to get pity from other people about it. They like for people to do things for them. And so, do you want to get well? And I think that is a good question for us, not only physically, but also spiritually. Do you want to get well? Do you want to be what God can make you? Do you want to have the blessings that he has in store for you? Do you want to get well? Verse 7, he says, I, I don't have anyone to help me get into the pool. And then somebody gets in before I do. I never can make it. Oh, me. Let's have a pity party. <laughs> and Jesus didn't say, I know how you feel. He did. Jesus didn't say, I understand. He did. There was a hopelessness in that man's situation from the physical side and from his mental side. He was not relying on God. He was not relying on God. I don't have anybody to help me. He's not relying on God. And I tell you that in our lives, in the everyday we live, we have a tendency to say, I do, I did, I failed, I didn't get done, I haven't completed all kinds of things that rely upon me and not God. So who do you rely on? Where do you put your trust? Where do you put your dependency? Who do you rely on? Jesus said, get up, take up your bed and walk. Huh? For 38 years, this man had not been able to get up and take up his bed and walk. Here comes the clutcher. The people in the temple knew him. They knew he was doing something he didn't normally do. Man did. And John wants you to know it's the Sabbath day. <laughs> now it was God, it was Jesus. Jesus is God who told him to take up his bed and walk. Now the law said you can't do any work on the Sabbath day. Hmm. <laughs> but there's no law against God telling him to do this. God did not break his own law when he told the man to take up his bed and walk. But the tradition of the Jews got in the way. Now the Jews have this, I'm going to call it a Bible commentary, okay? 
It's really not that. It contains their traditions and all the laws that they added. It's called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah said on the Sabbath day, it's okay to carry a bed if there is a sick person on it. But there is no sick person on it. And the Mishnah says you cannot carry an empty bed. They are very specific in it. And to the Jews, this was punishable by death. Did they overstep their bounds? Yes. God says it's okay to take up that bed and walk. The religious leaders, the elders of the religion of God said, you can't do that. It's the wrong day. So where is the thanksgiving among the religious people? Where is it that they're praising God and thanking God that a notable miracle has been done here? A man's life has been changed forever. Where is the thanksgiving? You'd think that the religious people, the priest, surely the priest would be thanking God. No, you can't do that. And I can just see him picking up rocks. They fix to take this guy out and stone him because he carried a bed on the Sabbath day. It's a wrong day. Well, John really wants you to know it's the Sabbath because the religious leaders have gone too far. And oftentimes, I think we have gone too far it should be a very simple thing for us to say, change the meeting time on Sunday morning to 8 o'clock in the morning. Or to say, we're not going to meet in the morning at all. Let's meet at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That would be a very difficult thing to do. Did you know that? <clears throat> Down at Spring, well, there are some men who decided that the nursery needed to be moved. Okay. So they came in and they tore out a wall in the auditorium to enlarge the auditorium. Yeah. It's all in an upheaval down there. They fixed uh, uh, the office where I usually run the bulletin off as the nursery because that's where the nursery had been. Change things up. And I'm saying to myself, what? I don't know why, but you know what? It felt real bad to me for them to do that because things have changed. It's no longer the way it was. But did it really make any difference? No, it did not make any difference. And some of them are wanting to take the pews out. Those are hand-built pews. They were built about 1957. Nice pews. And put in folding chairs. And I'm thinking, oh no. And I thought, it's just a building. What difference does it make? Hit my heartstrings? Oh, absolutely. Would I rather it didn't happen? Absolutely. But should it make any spiritual difference? No. No, it should not. So we need to ask ourselves, where is it we're putting the emphasis? Do we thank God for his blessings? Or do we say, you can't do that on the Sabbath day? You can't do that. Oh, it tears me up. I know it tore those priests up. And tradition can get in our way and caught up in our religion. And we need to be aware of that and we need to fight against it. But it should never be as important as the scripture, but it does become that important, like the time of that services. How many times have you heard it said, the scriptural time to me is? Now you know it's not in scripture, but you go two generations down with people hearing that and they will think it is. 
Just two generations. So as a pitiful man, and he did not need that pitiful religion. It was God's religion, all right, but people had stretched it and twisted it and turned it so that it no longer served the purpose that God wanted it to. And I've added in here that hope must be given to people because he was so hopeless. And with God, I can do all things through Jesus Christ our Lord. With God, all things are possible. And I need to be giving hope to people instead of a hopeless, pitiful religion. Here's something interesting. Jesus told the man, stop sinning or something worse might happen to you. Now this came up several times in Jesus' ministry. I think about the Tower of Siloam that fell on some people. And did this man sin or was it his parents? And the people connected that with sin, and Jesus said, it's not due to sin. And then with this man, he says, stop sinning or something worse might come on to you. He connected the man's healing with sin. Rex and I talked about that and said, well, it could have been that he was eating wrong. He got arthritis. Might have been. Might have been he became an alcoholic and... Uh, had fallen off of a cliff or something and crippled him. It might have been. It could be a lot of different things. We don't know what it was. But in this situation, on this occasion, Jesus connected his healing with sin. And I think that's important. So what is the so what of this? Well, let's begin by looking at the man. I'm getting ready to close it down. Let's begin by looking at the man. His hope was gone. He was in, had nothing but despair going on in his life. He was an invalid, and he was controlled by the circumstances. And when you get yourself in a situation like that, where the circumstances that you can't change control you, you go into depression. And life won't be worth living. Who has the answer? Jesus. Jesus has the answer. This man then represents all of us who can't deal with the realities, the circumstances, and the ill treatment of life. Life puts us in circumstances, and we have to deal with it both physically and spiritually. And Jesus comes to him. Do you really want to change? Is that what you want? And I tell you that you have to want to change in order to change. You ever hear that you have to go down to rock bottom before you'll change if you've got a bad uh, habit? That's true. Sometimes you have to be punished severely before you'll change your habits. And if that is so physically, it is also true spiritually. Do you want to change? I have a niece in Nashville called Friday morning. Her mother died from overdose of drugs. Her brother is in prison in uh, Arkansas for drugs. You know, just a bad, bad situation. And she grew up and she became an actress on Broadway. And a good one. And she quit that because they were abusing her. Now, we don't know what that abuse was. But she came back home to Nashville where her sister, no, her aunt lived. And her aunt took her in and showed her what it meant to live in a family because she didn't know. And took her to church and they were going to a Methodist church and that Methodist church started doing things with gays and so on. And they said, we can't handle this. This is not what I find in the Bible. And they started going to the 4th Street Church of Christ. 
Friday morning she was baptized into Christ. No hope. Do you want to change? Jesus is the answer to it. He offers us the change. But he wants us to know that it has something to do with us. We have to want that change. And we have to facilitate his changing us. But this is a sign for the glory of God. What Jesus can do for anyone who is spiritually sick. And I tell you, physically sick as well. Amen, Steve? If Lois were here, we could say it to her, and she'd say amen. It's twice in this congregation you've seen it, where God takes somebody and changes the life totally, and he can do it for anyone. The gift of forgiveness, life, and salvation. This is the day, folks. This is the resurrection day. Happy resurrection morning. And know that he sees you. Wherever you are, whatever your needs are, he sees you and he knows those needs. He has mercy and compassion. <laughs> If you will come to him. It's available to all of us. Jesus violates the priest's dogma. And they start persecuting him. And trying to kill him. Now that's a pitiful religion. It's as pitiful a religion. As that man was in a pitiful hopeless situation. That religion is pitiful. And that's what people do. Who get so far out with their religion. I want to do God a favor, so I'm going to kill you. That's the mind thought of an awful lot of people. That's not God's thought. That's taking the traditions and putting it into the religion and saying it's holy when it's a pitiful religion. They were taking the Sabbath, making it more important than the man but Jesus makes the man more important than the day. And don't you ever forget it. So what's conquered you? Has some of these things, sin, enemies, resentment, or other stuff, have they taken over your life so that you're in a hopeless situation? Know that Jesus can change that. So arise. Take up your bed and walk. Even if the religious people say it's not right, arise, do what Jesus says do rather than what anybody else says do. Arise, take up your bed and walk. Now we don't understand God, but he heals physically and spiritually and our response to him makes all the difference in all of it. See the glory of God in your life.